Hello everyone, this is Leslie Kristen and welcome to my Beauty Dharma Talks. And I am absolutely thrilled, overjoyed to present today, Melody LeBaron. And Melody is, as I call her, a goddess because she is just a goddess. And for those of you that do not know her, um, you will get to know her and you will want her to be your friend. So welcome, Melody. Oh, thank you. It's been so good to reconnect, Leslie. Yes, it is. And so I have, I have known Melody for about 20 years, I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Yes, it has, it has been a long time. Uh, I want to do her proper introduction and... <laughs> And she's actually, you're in Asheville, North Carolina, right? Yes, we finally got to move to the mountains. <laughs> ah, perfect, perfect. Yeah. So it is, so I have known, I'm here in uh, Orlando, Maitland, Florida, and uh, Studio Cara. And so Melody and I met, oh my goodness, um, we were thinking about this. I think I had hired her to do a space clearing for my house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, once, once you get that intimate into really clearing out, and of course, I've always been into those type of things, as those of you know, and that's why I love sharing people that are unique, authentic, enlightened, and that's what Beauty Dharma is all about. So this is perfect because it is March 1st. It is going to be the beginning of spring. I love the springtime. It just, oh, it's my favorite time of year. And so the topic that we're going to talk about is creating beauty and order in your home. And I'm going to share with you who Melody is before I hand over the microphone and she's just gonna enlighten us with all these cool things and tips. <laughs> <laughs> so Melody is a practitioner her clients call the house whisperer because she can sense the subtle energies that need to be cleared so each space can fulfill its longing to support those who live and work there. That is something we all need. Melody believes that our homes and our workspaces currently function and feel is a reflection of where we currently are in consciousness. She named her business Transforming Space, Self, and Loss because she believes you can't do one without the others happening. As soon as we begin to treat our homes with more respect and love, more respect and love begins to flow in our lives. Please join us to learn how immediately up-level your relationship with your home and workspace, even as you work to create sustainable systems, ideal feng shui, and beauty that mirrors your unique personality. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm listening to this and I am basically the beauty whisperer. <laughs> right. Yes, you are. And guess who did my makeup for my wedding, everybody? <laughs> yes, you are the beauty whisperer. Yeah, so that's so interesting because that's exactly what it is. It's, it's understanding who you are and then creating a look that that evolves all of that essence versus oh let me go on youtube and try to duplicate this look that looks amazing on this other on one. her yeah yeah exactly and so it's kind of like that it's really what you offer and bringing that intuition that consciousness oh my gosh i'm so excited okay <laughs> so, <laughs> um we are streaming also live on facebook so if you have questions for Melody, please uh, type them in. I'll be kind of going back and forth. And so if you have questions, we'll have some time that maybe she can answer a few. But with that said, Melody, I would love for you to you know, share how you got into this, who you are, all of that fabulousness. Okay. Well, I have had a vast spiritual geography in my life. This is my 30th home. I'm 66, so that's a lot of moving around. I had moved eight times before I was nine years old, so a lot of it was up front. We grew up quite poor, and we lived all over the U.S. and some places in Canada. And um, 
And so I was aware at the earliest age, I was really aware of the different um, nature energies or the different uh, frequencies of the land that we had lived on and how one differed from the other. And I was also super aware that in some of the homes we lived in, I could feel inside the house the same hum or the same heartbeat of Mother Earth that I felt playing outside. And in other homes, um, there, was, there was more stagnant energy and those were the homes in which my family had the most challenges. So um, I got to a point, and, and the other thing is that as the oldest of seven children, I was always the one who helped my mother pack and then move things and unpack and get organized and create beauty. And, um, and so I had this sort of knack or innate, um, if you remember the phrase, um, everything in its, a place for everything and everything in its place, you know, that's what I would do. I would, you know, the shape and the form of each home uh, dictated what we had to work with and then just creating order. So, but I got to a point in my twenties when I had little kids, my first four children, I have a miracle baby who was born 10 years after my fourth, but my first four children came in 76, 78, 80, 82, and each one of them was born in a different state. My then husband was transferred a lot, and I was the one doing all the work of setting up the home, And but there were a lot of medical issues at that time. There was a lot of stress, and I got to a place in my own life with the stress of the moves and my husband's health issues and my taking care of the babies that I could not create order. And my life felt like it was a high speed chase scene through an obstacle course. <laughs> and I was just this really um, awful version of myself that was constantly stressed. And I went to a parenting conference and there was a brochure there about, about organizing. And there was this voice in my head that was like, well, Melody, you don't need that. Like, you know how to do this. And then there was a humbler voice that said, um, honey, think about what your home looks like. You do need this. <laughs> and I, I got that brochure and I read through it and it was written by an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I am the furthest thing you'll meet from an engineer. I have deep respect for engineers. Um, I have, you know, a, my dad was a scientist, so I have a, a good bit of logic but what I realized is I didn't know how to create systems. Yeah. I knew how to create order out of chaos, but I didn't know how to create systems. And from that point on, that changed the way I worked with my own home. And that's when I really, I mean, up to that point, I had worked with other people to create order. But this was a whole new thing that was so easy to teach. And so... I call it creating sustainable systems because, um, you know, from my, I'm, a, I'm an environmentalist and from my perspective, everything we do has to be sustainable. Like, I don't believe in just going to the store and buying a bunch of stuff and bringing it home that I don't really need. We, and three years ago, when we moved to the mountains, we downsized by half, which means getting rid of half your books, half your clothes, half your furniture. <laughs> and we were happy to do that because um, I didn't want my life and my energy to be about maintaining stuff. Mm. I wanted my life to be about travel and our children and our family and my work in the world, not about things. So, um, so we downsized and we are really grateful. There's only one item out of half a house worth that we have said, shouldn't have given that away. <laughs> so that's pretty good. Yeah. That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of how it got started. And then in the 80s, uh, my middle son, Logan, had, we realized later, he had dyslexia and, and he had some other learning challenges. And the alphabet was hieroglyphics to him. He just wasn't getting it. He was in second grade. And he was struggling, he wasn't really reading. 
And I went off to a, to a conference about neuro-linguistic programming. Mm. And this was a conference um, for professionals. It was a conference for, you know, it was corporate America kind of presentation. But as I was listening to the material and neuro-linguistic programming is, is all about the understanding of the way of the brain talks to itself and how we receive information, how we receive love. So we all have a learning strategy and um, it's either auditory, what we learn best by listening or visual, we learn best by reading and our school systems are set up for auditory and visual learners or you're kinesthetic and you don't really learn unless your body is moving. And I was like, holy moly. That's my son. So I got home from the conference. I created sandpaper letters for him, uh, letters out of sandpaper and tracing it with, you know, with his body. And all of a sudden he was reading. So that got me to realizing that the systems that I was helping my clients create for themselves. So working in someone's home, especially like the workplace where there's a lot of papers everywhere, I got to realizing, okay, I'm creating systems that work for the way my brain remembers where it's put something. And I developed an assessment for what I call the unique retrieval strategy. How does your brain remember where you've put something? So I just developed this simple assessment so that I can take my clients through this assessment and look at them and listen to them and, and help them understand if they have a visual unique retrieval strategy. We set up the file system with Manila and you know, file folder, like it all can look the same. Those, those labels, they're so visual, they're gonna remember where they put everything. But if they're auditory, we have to give extra cues. We have to listen to certain music. We have to put things away in a certain way. I have to tune them to the sounds of the file drawer that we're putting things in. And if they're kinesthetic, oh my goodness, <laughs> we really have to get creative. And I love, you know, I love for that creativity to be needed. <coughs> so yeah. Wow. It's really fun. <laughs> that is, that had to be such an aha moment for you. Oh, it was huge. Mm -hmm. It was huge because, you know, I would get calls for, like, I've actually worked with people who were in the hoarders category, mm -hmm. right? And as some of my clients have actually had a clean sweep where you have a team of people come in and take all the stuff out and sort and do all of that for you. And they called me because it was seven or eight years later and it was all back again. And so really the value of this work is the skill transference. The value of this work is, is me transferring the skill to the clients. And like I'm teaching a class right now on creating sparkle and sanctuary at home where I'm transferring like the four pillars, the foundational pieces that people need. But it used to be that I would get a lot of calls from clients whose systems I had helped them create, but we, they, they would say, I, I need an update. Like it's been a year, like I need you to help me update. And what I began to realize is, okay, this system is all Manila folders. It all looks the same. And this client is more auditory. And so we would have to change it up. We would have to add colored folders, colored labels. And with my, with my kinesthetic clients, I have to, we have to store things sometimes in baskets. There's a great story. One of my clients worked for a, worked for a telephone service, like a, an answering service. And so she answered the phones for four different, like one was a doctor's office, one was a plumber, you know, she had four different clients. And so meaning she had four different scripts. So I sat there and watched her work um, and I watched her answer the phone and she was getting sort of bad reviews because she was opening her file drawer, fumbling through to find the right script for the client who was calling. And, um, 
and then pretending to work at that doctor's office or for the plumber or whatever. She was working from her home, but you know. And so she didn't sound very professional. And what I realized when I took her through this assessment is that she was kinesthetic. And she also didn't like sitting in a chair. And so what we ended up doing was getting clothesline and nailing clothesline to the walls in her office with and, and then hanging plastic sleeves with the script in the plastic sleeves. And so when she would pick up the phone and see who was calling, she would go to that part of the room and begin walking, <laughs> walking along as she read that script. And she was on her feet. She was, she was, it was much more enjoyable for her. She had decorated with craft paper, like it was really pretty as well as functional. So yeah, you, you, sometimes you have to get really creative, like different textured baskets, like all kinds of fun things. That's yeah. genius. That is genius. Yeah. Yes. Because I, I find, you know, when, when we are a particular way and we have clients that they either learn or students that learn so differently. Right. You, you do, you have to see how the, and, and I think a lot of that is through, you know, through us listening and of course experience as well. You know, right. this is right. something that you've been doing for so many years and you've been able to create these systems and, you know, be able right. to, to teach this to so many other people. Oh, I love that. So yeah. share with me, um, share some of the things that people can do, like the top three, four things that people can do to create beauty and order. And I have to tell you that I never really put the two of them together. <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> right? Yeah. I never really put the two of them together because I've always been the artist that has always, like when I was growing up and in high school, I always fought um, routine and, and, you know, like I just, yeah, I need to be free. <laughs> I, I'm a free wheeler. You know what I mean? Like, I just gotta, don't pin me down and tie me down, you know, like it's, and so I always fought that. And so for me, like thinking of order, I, I thought of being oppressed and order. Being controlled, being controlled. Yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, controlled, exactly. And one of my, one of the other ladies that I actually uh, interviewed for the Beauty Dharma Summit, she is an author, Alexandra Stoddard, and she spoke about order and that- You interviewed Alexandra Stoddard. I did, and she- Whoa unbelievable she's like my new bff i love this lady yes and you'll have to watch it if you guys love alexandra starter you need to go to my youtube channel cara cosmetics and um she's phenomenal i did not know who she was and one of the other speakers had told me that she was a mentor of hers and so i called her up and this was her very first um virtual interview that oh, i have fun yes and she is, she was like talking to the Dalai Lama, I swear. She was just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, wow. So that's great. I'm so, I'm so uh, excited that you know her. Yeah. And yeah. So order was, she really kind of opened my mind because it does. So share some of these things on how, you know. Well, first of all, first of all, I, I want to say that we're, we're all unique. Like we talked about with our beauty, we're all unique. We're all different. And, um, and some of us have a higher tolerance for what I would consider clutter. Let, let's, first of all, let's define clutter because I think that would be helpful. The, the etymology of the word is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. um, clutter comes, the word clutter comes from the old English word cloiter, which literally means to coagulate. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what happens um, and I can test it with the dowsing rod. That's exactly what happens to in a, in a home where there are too many items, right? So clutter causes the energy to coagulate, to stagnate. And so what, what is clutter? Well, clutter is too many items in too small a space, items that you're not using, that you're not loving. Um, 
and things that are broken or unrepaired. And so, and, and what's the effect on the space? Well, the effect on the space, let's say that you had a job, you, you worked in a company and you showed up for work and you were full of desire to serve and skill and you were completely overlooked, completely ignored, right? And after a while, you would, you would start to feel stagnant. You would start to feel unhappy. So that's exactly what happens in, in a space. I believe that there's consciousness or life force singing through everything created, not just human beings, right? Human beings want to put our, ourselves at the top of the sort of, we, we are tending to think in a hierarchy, uh, but I've had too many indigenous teaching teachers. I have to throw the hierarchy out and recognize that the human and more than human world is alive and intelligent. And there's life force singing through everything created, right? The water in the river, the rocks, um, the, um, the grass, like there's intelligence, the butterflies, the, not just our animals that we, it, that we domesticate, but all animals have intelligence. And, and then in, in a science class many, many years ago, I realized, okay, so the elements that make up the walls and the floor and the ceiling of the body of my house, these are the same elements that make up my body. So it, it started to like fall into place for me that um, Eastern, you know, um, there's, there's a big difference. When I was studying feng shui, there's a big difference in how um, the Chinese are trained from birth in the Japanese, the Asian people and any indigenous culture around the world has been trained from birth to experience and to see the spaces they live and work in. Mm -hmm. And let me just illustrate it with this. I'm gonna hold up my hand and I'm gonna ask you, Leslie, ask you watching, the people watching, how many items do you see? <laughs> and so Leslie, what would you tell me? You see five, you see the five fingers. Some people would say they see one hand, but if I were to hold up my same hand outstretched like this in any class of children or adults, in Asia or in any indigenous tribe, they would look at this and they would see nine items mm. because they don't just see the items protruding into the space. They actually experience the spaces between the items as part of the whole. And so we've been trained, Westerners have this very uh, cartoonish two-dimensional relationship with the land we live on. We don't have any more awareness of the spirit or consciousness of the land we live on than the first white people who came to this country and they saw native faces peering out from behind the trees and they called the land uninhabited. And then they marched into the woods and started chopping down what the Native Americans called standing people, the trees, to build forts to keep out well, now that we're gonna acknowledge them, we're gonna call them barbarians or savages, right? And so they didn't, you know, they planted their flag into the land and claimed it for their king and their country without ever connecting to the spirit of the land. Mm -hmm. And when I started off by saying I have a vast spiritual geography, I have a vast, in my body, I have a vast awareness of how my body responds to living in all these places around the US and Canada. They, the mountains in the Canadian Rockies have been my earliest teachers, as was the prairie in Canada that my ancestors grew up on. And, um, you know, there's just been, and, and the places of my ancestry to which I've traveled when I went to Ireland, like you attune to the land. So, now thinking about, well, what's the Western way of experiencing being inside of a home or a workspace? Well, let's say we move into the house. It's like taking a new lover. We have to figure out where the light switches are in the dark. 
And, you know, we, we acknowledge all the things we fell in love with this place. We, we love this apartment or this house for these reasons. And then after a few weeks or months, we've, we've put out our furniture, we've hung the art, we may have redone a few, painted the walls to our liking, whatever. But then the, the space inside just kind of goes flat for us. It just becomes dead to us. We are not thinking of the space inside our, our, the body of our home as alive. But if you and I were to walk in the woods, if we were to you know, walk along uh, having a conversation and I were to say to you, Leslie, do you believe that nature is alive and intelligent? What would you say? Absolutely. And if I were to ask you, do you believe that nature right here in the woods is aware of us what would you tell me? Absolutely. And somehow we enclose nature with these walls and the cement foundation. We enclose nature and it's not alive. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Like we really have to uh, recognize that our paradigm has some flaws to it. Yes. And so the first thing that I teach my clients, even before, like usually even before we dig in and start the organizing process is um, your space is alive, it's intelligent mm -hmm. and it wants to serve you. And everything created, even man-made creations, even my chair, even my desk, everything has a, you know, a lifespan it, and it wants to fulfill the measure of that creation. Um, so why would we think that the rocks are alive and intelligent and the desk isn't? Mm -hmm. it, it's a very much a more indigenous way of looking at things. And it, it causes us to look at things with more respect. Yes. So the number one thing I usually have to do when I work with clients who have a good bit of uh, need for order is there, there are some rooms or closets or drawers in their space that they don't like. And we've got a relationship. We're in a relationship with our homes. And that relationship is either raising our mood or lowering it. It's raising our energy level or lowering it. We've got a relationship with every piece of furniture in that house, every piece of art, every piece of paper that's either raising or lowering our mood and energy level. Mm -hmm. And so when a client walks into a room where there's a lot of papers or there's a lot of items that are calling for her attention, that are demanding her attention because they're not sorted, they're not being used, they're not being loved, they're not being valued, she's not just hitting a wall of stagnant energy, she's actually hitting a wall of her own judgment. Mm. because she's got a judgment on the space and maybe even on herself. And so the first thing we do and the most profound thing we do is we release the judgment. Mm. So have you ever noticed being in a relationship with another human being, maybe a love relationship, maybe a parent-child relationship? Have you ever noticed, Leslie, that when you have a judgment on the other person, you become less effective at communicating and connecting and really creating a desired outcome. Have you ever noticed that? Oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, when I married my husband, um, we've been together 19 years. Um, we're coming up on, let's see, this will be our... Yeah, this will be our 19th wedding anniversary. And um, when, when we were dating, I vowed that I would never speak to him or with him while I was holding a judgment on him. So that has meant that there were certain things I couldn't speak about until I had cleared my judgment, right? So lots of inner work required. And I haven't always managed to uh, be true to that, but that that is my guiding principle, right? So the very first thing we have to do when we're working in a space in which there's something we don't prefer is we have to clear, we have to be willing to let our judgment go. Mm. And usually 
for most people, there is a very good reason why there's a lack of order. They may have been through a stressful time. There may have been health issues, just like looking back on my own experience with a house full of clutter. There were very good reasons why it was that way. And sometimes with some of my clients, we have to go back into their childhood to find the very good reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Because like I said, we're in a relationship with our home. And so many of us, by the, our 30s or 40s, we have cleaned up our love relationships. We don't tolerate abuse. We don't tolerate dysfunction. And yet we may have co-created in our homes or our workspaces conditions or situations that bring up those same kinds of overwhelm, neurological overwhelm, or those same kinds of issues. So getting back to your question on order, very first thing we have to do is release judgment for how it is, why it is the way it is, and just hold compassion. Self-compassion, um, one of my teachers, uh, Frances Weller, says that um, self-compassion is literally a soul maturation requirement. Like in order to mature your soul, you have to be able to hold compassion, not just for others, but for yourself. And then the second thing is to reframe order systems and just mentally reframe it from control, from feeling like I'm being controlled to I am creating containment. I am creating strong, healthy boundaries, um, containment for the things I love. So for my art supplies, for my books, for my research material for my whatever it is that is in your file drawers or is on your shelves or in your closets, you are creating healthy containment, healthy boundaries. And when I, like I'm teaching this class right now and last week we had a, you know, we had a class and so many of the women in the class have said, I had to go back and rewatch the recording because when you talked about I'm in a relationship with my home and I'm creating containment for myself and what I love. It just, it just blew the circus. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're, it down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, and so then once we have, so what I realized during a period of time in my life is that I had no appropriate boundaries or containment for the things I loved in my home. And this was in a prior marriage and there was, there was some trauma and there was some abuse. And you know, in, in those kinds of situations, there's, you're always in fight or flight or survival mode. And I remember one day I, um, I so I had a part-time job. And so I would get the kids off to school, but I had to pull from the, out of the master bed, under the master bed, I had to pull all of my work supplies so that I could set myself up on the floor to make my phone calls and to do this part-time job. Hmm. And I realized there's, there, you know, and I had advocated and advocated and advocated for a bookshelf, for a desk, and it just wasn't a priority for him. And, um, so that was, you know, that was a really interesting awareness for me that I didn't have what I needed to contain what I needed to do my job. Or yeah. love. Yes. Yes. So obviously I'm, I'm in a much different situation than I was back then, but it literally has been my, um, I guess, you know, my teacher, Francis Weller, that I did my grief training with, um, he talks about self-compassion being the, the process of maturing your soul. Mm -hmm. I would actually say that the work I do in, in homes and workspaces is that similar process because you can't transform your environment. When you go through the process of saying, okay, this belongs to a former version of myself. Mm -hmm. This was my last career. I don't need these papers. I don't need these books. I don't need these ego props from the last movie set <laughs> I was in. Um, 
and you you're defining yourself and you're transforming yourself and so the process of defining and transforming your space will transform you and along the way we always um find you know um losses that have not yet been integrated not yet been fully integrated and so as i'm with my clients who have massive amounts of clutter i very often find you know it comes toward the end of the project we find the outfit she was wearing when she was raped and she's never told anyone oh. or we find the boxes that he inherited from his grandfather who abused him and so you know and so there's all this loss that has to be integrated in order for us to let go of those items or or properly display those items or properly you know put them back into circulation by donating them and so it's it's a it's a process where all three need to be brought in right we need to bring them uh, the loss and the pain and the and the sadness into the circle of our compassion and our the light of our awareness um so so once sustain once the editing process is done in my clients homes and those losses have been integrated then it's really this joyful process of watching them make decisions about now that i've freed up so much space in my house and also time and sort of energy that i've of spent all these years spinning my wheels in this you know sort of cluttered environment once i freed all of that now what do i want my legacy work in the world to be mm. So I get to have a front row seat to amazing transformations mm -hmm. of people who start businesses or write books or because because they've cleared up their time and their space. And and so one of the things I do with these clients at the end of the process as they're beginning to really feel their future version of themselves is closer because they've let go of everything from their environment that doesn't correspond to that future version um we feng shui the space and feng shui is the deepest most beautiful way that i know about to create beauty while partnering with your your space and in feng shui um you you use a an energy grid an energy map called the bagua the feng shui bagua and you super you superimpose that bagua over the footprint of your home the same way that you superimpose the meridian the acupuncture meridian map over the body right not all physical bodies are the same size and shape but you adjust you know to find where those meridians are where you can access and you can put um in the case of acupuncture you put a needle mm -hmm. that activates the chi in that area or in the case of acupressure you put a little pressure you put your attention and in feng shui we've got these areas of the bagua that literally are like portals that you that you place an altar and an altar is just an item or a group of items that up levels your mood and and energy and sort of um reminds you of your intention. And so we've got these nine areas of the bagua that we have uh we create altars that align my clients um desires and longings and intentions for their life with the body and the spirit of their home. So and it's you know an altar is obviously if it's something that reminds you of your intentions it's going to be beautiful to you and so so yeah it's wildly fun process <laughs> oh my gosh so i have a million things going through my head right now <laughs> because for me so i i'm thinking that an altar can also be art of course you know? of course absolutely a piece yeah. of art that can symbolize because art for me is is everything um 
but um, absolutely, and and clearing that space. Okay, so with that said, <laughs> um, I would love for you to share the story on how you met your husband. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so. Um, we met actually during the time that you and I were working together. Um, so I had, I had been married twice and both um, in both marriages were huge learning experiences. Like talk about maturing, maturing my identity and maturing my soul, huge learning, painful learning experiences. And I really got to, and, and, I, and I recognized that I needed to cloister myself. And this was actually, I, I, was, I, I was doing the space clearing training, but it was, it was actually at the very beginning of my feng shui training. And when I say cloister, I mean, I didn't date. I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> like I, I was literally doing a lot of self-development, a lot of healing, a lot of therapy, working with a biofeedback therapist, like doing a lot of work to release the trauma from my body, my mind, and my emotions. And, um, and so during that time, when I started my feng shui training, I was, I was uh, you know, looking at some feng shui materials. And I remembered that word cloister that I had been using in conversation because my friends were like, you're not dating. Why are you not dating? And I was like, just really feel like I want to cloister myself for a while. And I looked around my room. I had white carpet, white antique, uh, antique bedroom furniture painted white, a white comforter, white linens, white walls, no art on the wall. Like it was a cocoon. <laughs> it was just, a, you know, a cocoon. And um, I'm like, oh, wow. And then I looked over into my relationship corner and that corner was not just the relationship corner for the room. It was also the relationship area for the whole entire house. And I looked at that corner and I had lived in this house for about a year and I had intended to make that area of the bedroom a, a I had intended to, to put a bookshelf there but that just never got high enough on the list of priorities to go out and find the right bookshelf and get it. And so I, but I had books that I needed to put. And so I had these, you know, moving book boxes that I had um, put on their sides and just opened them so that they were like the file boxes you can buy at Staples. And so I had them on their side with the books there and one stacked on top of the other, except that over time, over maybe probably the first six months, the bottom box began collapsing. And so I just set them side by side. And when I looked at those two boxes and thought about the meaning, it completely explained. So I had been in a relationship. I had dated a wonderful, wonderful man, but energetically and emotionally, and financially, I was carrying that relationship. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at that bottom box, which was all caved in, and I felt how that felt in my body, mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, what a perfect metaphor. And so obviously, like I went to work putting, putting in, you know, getting a nice bookshelf and putting the, arranging the books. And when I was ready, I created an altar that fully depicted not only who I wanted to be with, but who I wanted to be. So on my altar, which had a pair of candles and a picture of a happy couple that I had cut out of a magazine, because frankly, at that time, I didn't know any personally. <laughs> this kind of goes to show how, you know, my involvement. Um, but um, I, I had, I had on my, on my altar, I had this beautiful little container, this heart shaped container. And in that container, I had written a list of who I wanted to be with, 
the kind of man I wanted to be with and what qualities he would have, but also how I wanted to show up the parts of me that I wanted to come forth in a relationship. So who I wanted to be with and who I wanted to be. And then um, not that long after I feng shuied for relationship, I was introduced to my current husband and we started getting to know each other and he found out I did feng shui. And so he invited me to his house to feng shui his house. And we really didn't know each other. Like, like uh, I knew his name. I didn't know a whole lot. Um, and so I said, well, okay, uh, when we feng shui a home, we're feng shuiing for your intentions, for your life. So just, you know, I'm, I, and I said, I'm just gonna write them down and leave them here with you, but let me know, like, what are your intentions for your life? And he said, well, I'm single and I would prefer not to be single. <laughs> So um, as we were going through his home, it turns out that he had a bathtub, a beautiful heart-shaped, huge, lovely bathtub in his relationship corner. And I said, okay, well, it's lovely that this bathtub is heart-shaped, but we really want to mitigate for the fact that it's a water element and you're going to need to, and there was a lovely little shelf, and I said, you're going to want to put your relationship intentions in a container on the shelf. Um, and, you know, I told him what other altar items he could put. And so anyway, months and months later, we were, you know, we were dating exclusively by this time. And um, I was at his house and we were in the bathtub together. And I said, so did you ever like, did you ever write that list of, of intentions? And he said, oh, actually I wrote, I wrote that list before, um, before I just put it in the, and he you know, pointed to this little heart shaped container behind me. And I said, can I read your list? And he said, okay. <laughs> and so I take it out of this little heart shaped box and I start reading the list of who he wanted to be with, which he had written before he'd met me. And I looked at him and I'm like, you wrote me down. And he said, I know. <laughs> so that was a sweet date right there. That was a really sweet date. Yeah. Yeah. So very, very sweet. So like you said, I mean, it really is about placing that intention. Uh, it, it's, it, it's perfect that that's how you met your husband because like you said, you know, what's your legacy? <laughs> right? You you live it, you breathe it, you you do it. <laughs> yeah. living proof right there. And it's so true. And um, so what are some of the okay, well let's so if someone wants to work with you, okay, how can you work with you, of course. So my website is transforming space. Dot com and I'll I'll share that with you and um, and if you want to learn more about feng shui go to my website there's a ton of information I actually worked with a graphic designer who created a bagua that gives so much information um, in that bagua you can see little dots in each square in each gua to show you the colors that can be used to activate your intentions for each area shows which areas partner with each other. So there's a lot of information on my website and absolutely if people want to work with me, there's a contact page there and they can get in touch with me. And um, yeah, and I, I regularly do video interviews where, which I share with my list to share ideas and tips. And, and I'm teaching right now a four week course, the second, uh, the second class is tonight. Um, and, you know, I, I will be teaching other, other courses during the year. So if people uh, want to find out more and just be part of my community, they can sign up for my emails. And oh, one of the fun things that I do is teach people how to attune with the land they live on, and then really bring their their intentions into their space in a tangible way. And there are two visualizations that go with that. 
that are free if you go to my website and sign up for my list. So, oh, I'm doing that definitely. Yeah, because it's been so long, and of course, I've moved as well. The homes that you, two of my homes, I don't live there anymore. <laughs> right, right. And yeah. you've changed the space you're working in. Absolutely. You know, I have my little 91 year old mom. So she has one side of the home. I have another side of the home. And so talk about, you know, when you were talking about relationships and, and uh, oh my gosh, letting go of judgment, that happens daily. <laughs> right, right. Yes. <laughs> Yes. I mean, for me, my relationships are my spiritual practice. It shows me exactly where I need to do my work. <laughs> now, can someone also do a space clearing with you or feng shui? Can they do that virtually? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do need to meet the house first. So when I have, when I have a client who wants a space clearing, she sends me her street address, some photos of certain things, and then I meet the house energetically first. And then we get on Zoom or FaceTime and she takes me through the house and I've got my little dowsing rod. And, um, you know, and I, I have a, I teach feng shui. So I have a workbook to prepare people if they want to do a feng shui session. And they're so much fun to do. They're so much fun. So I work with clients all over the world now. I love that. Yes, that is so fun. Well, I highly recommend that you check out her website. I mean, Melody is unlike anyone you will ever meet. And the way that you have, I'm, I mean, I was almost in tears listening to you talk about how our home is because we completely disregard so much about our home and how our home supports us and supports a life that that we can just thrive in or exactly and one of the things people don't really think about because they think about the home as sort of this inanimate thing mm -hmm. not as something that might be alive that might contain intelligence and um and once we sort of shift the viewpoint, once we become really aware of the intelligence of the land we're living on and the intelligence of the space we're in, we begin treating it not just with more respect and care, but it becomes a partner to us in a way that it couldn't if we didn't treat it that way, right? Yeah. And so I, you know, yeah, it's, it's just a more ancient viewpoint that I feel like needs to come back into our, because, so, you know, if, if we have white skin, we're not just colonizers, we've been colonized, right? And we need to bring our awareness and attention back to some really ancient practices that our, our ancestors had before we were colonized. Sure. Things that we've just learned, right? Yeah. And here you are to teach us new way. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, this has been a beautiful, beautiful interview. Thank you so much for all your wisdom. I hope all of you watching the replay or um, on Melody's site or on go to our YouTube channel at Cara Cosmetics, C-A-R-A cosmetics.com. I have lots of other interviews. If you like goddesses and fabulous, intelligent, kick ass women on the planet. That is what it's about. It's about living life beautifully and on purpose. Right. And, um, and so I, I have to, I have to tell you one more thing, Leslie, yeah. since you and I spoke, I did a strength assessment and it's like these 27 qualities that you might have and it ranks them in order. And so my, my number one uh, strength is love and compassion. My number two, appreciation of beauty. <laughs> oh, yay! <laughs> and I'm like, yep, that sounds like me. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, that's a conversation for a whole other day. I mean, my whole Beauty Dharma Summit was, that was, that was the topic because I think that we are, again, I think a lot of it is we think of beauty as a whole lot of makeup or a whole lot of, you know, this whole superficial conversation and do not think of beauty in so many small different little ways that 
is a reflection of who we are and self beauty is the biggest one to really unravel. So yes, taken years to own that one. (laughs) Right. Right. And you know, when you think about beauty and creating beauty and order in your home, really you have to have order before the beauty can really shine. Um, But um, my inspiration for a lot of what I do is John O'Donohue, right? The poet, the, who talks about um, approaching, approaching anything that's happening in your life through the lens of beauty. He's got a wonderful book called The Embrace of Beauty. Um, yeah, I think it's called The Embrace of Beauty. Mm. And um, yeah, so it's really vital because, because when we take an aesthetic approach to life, we're living uh, with all of our senses. All of our senses are alive. We're happy, we're, you know, we're, we're vibrant, we're joyful. The opposite of an aesthetic approach, a, a beautiful approach, is an anesthetic approach where we're just numbed as we're going through life. Mm. And when we have homes with that have order and beauty, that helps us not to want to numb ourselves, right? No, you get to enjoy the place you live in. Exactly. To, yes, life is so much more joyful and, and it's in so many different areas. The same thing that I do. I can't do a makeup lesson with you until we've gone through everything you have. Same thing, creating that. I've never really thought of it that way, but absolutely we inventory your products and take a look at what serves you, what doesn't serve you, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, what colors, all of that. And then we can create and design after that. Right. right. And you always start with a clean face. <laughs> exactly. You're not putting it on, on top of what you're ready at. Right. Yes. Yes. So it absolutely, it's, it really is that, that similar process. But again, it's just bringing out that essence of who you are and um, the same. So I can't wait. I am going to, I am going to call you and, <laughs> And do a space clearing and feng shui in my house. Oh, I would love that. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's way overdue. (laughs) Uh, I'm so excited. And Melody, I just want to thank you so much. We will be doing another interview with Melody about a completely different topic as well. So for those of you, but I hope this inspires you for spring. I know that it's been, you know, a lengthy uh, conversation that we have, but it's been, I feel it's been riveting and it's been so needed in the world that we've lived in, in this past 12, 14 months so far. And we have been locked in our homes. So why yes. not honor these homes yes. and clean them and nurture them and love them and I mean, all of this and, and what better time than spring to exactly. Yes. To do that. So I'm going to check out your webinars and your courses. Thank you so much. You are a beautiful goddess and you just shine light around the world. And I am very grateful for your time and I'm grateful for all of you watching my beauty Dharma talks. I'll have many more because I know a lot of fabulous people. (laughs) Yes, you do. I do. And there's so much information to share. And so you can go to to transformingspace.com. Right. And that's for Melody. You can also go to caracosmetics.com and you can check out all of the fabulous, beautiful things that we have at Cara Cosmetics. And so, I mean, what a beautiful combination we have here. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful journey and have fun cleansing your homes and, and, and also updating your looks. So we are here to serve you and just to make life more beautiful. So thank you so much, Melody. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.